Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. I mean, really, like it's a, it is such a surreal and poignant um, moment for me. Like Arden said, I uh, grew up here. Um, I have to thank Arden, like for making this happen for county or to county uh, for making this happen to Sherry Chris for making this happen. Um, I, this museum is so special to me, obviously. I, um, I d have drawn the statue of Pan like innumerable times, the one in the courtyard, uh, which is where we'll all be mingling afterwards. Um, and uh, this uh, talk especially comes with a lot of like, f a, a new like fresh existential uh, flavor being that like most of my, most of the audience is like my immediate family, uh, including. <laughs> including my 88, um, my 88, my 93, and oh, my 90-year-old grandparents. So round of applause for that, please. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we should just start at the top, um, which is where, where we are. Um, so my background is unusually technical uh, for an artist. Uh, I grew up programming and first making combines with a dot matrix printer. I started teaching myself how to code when I was five. Um, and I grew up playing like first person shooter games and R RPG um, games. Uh, and I taught intro to hacking at a computer camp in high school. Um, <laughs> you know, just like light things like that had my own website. Um, so like the piece in the permanent collection, which you'll see here, I have a hybrid approach to the way that I work. These are called hologram combines, what, was, what Arden already beautifully described. Um, I am a multidisciplinary artist, uh, which means I work in installation and sculpture, uh, painting, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, among many others. So I think I'm gonna start with uh, this co-commission by the KW Institute of Contemporary Art and the Museum of American Art uh, because it's the best lens for addressing what my work is about. Um, I tend to work in themes of sovereignty, auto autonomy, volition um, around technology and its impacts on our consciousness. Um, and I often use personal symbolism that I weave in with research and um, a lot of different references. So this project was born of research into brain to machine implants and actually DNA, uh, some, co some research I was doing into coding in DNA and RNA. So I was bringing my pro programming background uh, as an application to address NFTs and fungibility, which we can go into later. We don't have to do that right now. But, <laughs> and this was a, a nod to where uh, computing is eventually going, which is into biocomputing. The, after this project was done, which is, this is my uh, DNA on the right here. This is a protein that I extracted from this code. Uh, this is a, uh, the copy of the longevity gene, um, which uh, we, my family members can attest to. Uh, the name of the gene is FOX03. Uh, and that is a new application of, well, just an interesting fun fact. One of the uh, first and one of the most exciting things that has come out of um, AI is this way that we can predict protein modeling. Um, and so this is using this algorithm. So let's go into what the mob is about. So this was created to, as an, as, like I wanted to make this as a sort of calibration point for where we are in time um, and what our idea of technology is at the moment. Um, so what we're looking at is a documentation of the work that was staged in a 17th century anatomical theater in Berlin um, that was, like I was saying, commissioned by KW and uh, the Whitney Museum of Art. And the reason that we chose this site is because of all of the research that initially happened here in the 17th century uh, around technology and its applications um, in, in the body. So viewers would enter this auditorium. It's a two-level installation. And um, audience members would enter the auditorium and you would see participants using uh, virtual reality. They would be in headsets looking at their hands through the headsets, which actually here, I think I can actually, just quickly as demonstration, this is during one of the openings. And then we can go back to the other documentation. So at the vector of their hands, 
they would see a part of this time-based uh, project um, revealing itself. So, um, so yes, okay, so viewers would enter. The, the project is, the, the reason I chose this to start talking about uh, what all of my work is about is because it is so hybrid in nature. It's like it's dealing with installation and augmented and virtual reality. There's a internet, um, there's internet art that's woven in through the Whitney's Commission, which is now part of their permanent collection. Um, it uh, has sculpture that was put in situ uh, in the existing vitrines that are from the 17th century, which we'll see here in a, in a moment. Um, Eh, actually, we'll go back to this later. Yeah, we're good. The piece then traveled to the Whitney Museum of Art, which is where it's installed in multiple levels. So this is the, on the right hand side, there's an installation that used this transparent LED material. And then in the lobby gallery, uh, it then just, well, it just came down at the Emerson Museum at the Boston, um, in Boston. Okay, and then let's move on towards, so using the same, so because I use a lot of uh, these, these characters uh, throughout my work that I've really been using and started developing since I was quite young, um, they populate a lot of the, the works that I make. So these are, this is the series, that this is as I was developing. So I've been working on these hologram combines which is the work that's here in the museum since 2018. Uh, here's some studio shots. Um, so that what you're looking at is the conventional application of oil on canvas and airbrush techniques. And attached to the surface of the painting is a motorized fan that is, uh, has LED, an L array of LEDs uh, that are embedded into the blade of the fan. And they're programmed to move so fast that you can't see the blade, but you just see sort of the persistence or the ghost of the um, video work. Um, and they exist, for me, they're sort of digital annotations and um, reflect this sort of like awkward truth that, um, as Arden was saying, that have this like a, a sort of uncomfortable or uncanny intervention as a technological intervention on top of a painting. And this is an install from more studio process. And this was the install, this is the installation from, um, from County where the piece was originally uh, conceived. And a lot of what you're seeing, so I make I'm, all of the works start in virtual reality or 3D modeling software. Um, so that you're seeing a, like all of these animations are things that I've either stored or sa are saved from this like repository that I keep mining from. Um, that's just self, they're self-referential symbols and animations that I make. So now I wanna go all the way back to 2015 because I think it's like an important way to talk about um, my approach because this has to do with a solo show titled Lossie. And the name is taken from an algorithm. It's the uh, algorithm that we're the most familiar with. It's actually an entropy algorithm. Uh, it's how we store JPEGs and MP3s. Um, and lossy just means entropy. Uh, lossless means lack of loss. Lossy means full of loss. Um, the title of the virtual reality piece at the center of this show was I came and went as a ghost hand. And in the virtual reality piece, what you're seeing are these sort of islands of memories and I'm using photogrammetry, or I used photogrammetry to scan in things that felt particularly poignant or salient, um, like um, my childhood home, um, or parts of my studio in New York, um, you know, things that just felt emotionally charged. And um, on the gaze of the viewer inside virtual reality, there's an entropy script that's eating away at these memory islands. Um, so, when you would enter the virtual reality, you would see a sort of record of what everyone's experience of like sort of carving away at these, um, these pieces that, are that were important to me. And uh, the 
paintings outside of the headset were made from these um, sort of save points, as you can see. Oh, this is the one in Beth's collection. It's titled Mirror Milk. Okay, so is there anything else about this? Uh, I don't think so. Yes, please ask a question. Yes, please. I would love that. Um, so when the viewer would enter this piece, their entry would be like, because of their entry, this would start to descend. Right? Yes, so slowly. Oh. Yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> exponential. Um, Arden's question was uh, where, like how this was experienced. And so uh, what she's asking is like, would would someone's experience when they would put the headset on, they would see a record of uh, the viewers that had come before them in that day of what had been sort of chewed away at. And so you're seeing a record of, um, of attention, basically. Yeah, so you're just seeing a record of attention that then you, after you take the headset off, um, you have that sort of feeling of this uh, uncanny, like you've been there, but you also haven't. And um, there's sort of plein air spaces that have to do f uh, of uh, something that's, uh, there's like an uncanniness to, to memory. You know, there's like a lossy, like a lossy quality to memory. So, so every day. Every, well, n yes, every day would change. And it was interesting because it's like based on the weather even. So you could see that where people's attention sort of pooled um, and deteriorated. Should we take questions in general? No, okay. Yeah. Because I see a question. Yes? This is so much more fun. <laughs> oh, I can repeat them also. It wasn't on yet. Sorry. We're going off script. We're going off script. <laughs> I, we weren't ready for mic time yet. I love that. Is so I was just curious if there was a part of this memory that nobody went to, it would be intact? Yes. Nice. Yes, but it was reset every 24 hours. So it was programmed. It was programmed to um, to, to refresh itself, cool. or based on how, how it felt. So uh, let's let's jump ahead to 2016. This is the first piece that the Whitney Museum acquired. It's a virtual reality piece titled Man Mask, um, and the premise of this piece, when I was speaking to the curator, had to do with. Um, Actually, my childhood growing up playing first-person shooter games, primarily Call of Duty, uh, because to, to find a point of neutrality, which meant just not being female in that context, I had to wear a man mask. And so I'm giving a, a body awareness meditation directly to the viewer uh, by using facial motion capture, which is on the left side. So that was the process uh, for making this. And so what you're, you're moving through in virtual reality is this, these sort of hacked assets, these, um, these sort of abandoned or discarded hacked assets from Call of Duty, um, which we can see here. And it was funny because it's like, when I was talking about the development, I also remembered that I would use a, the name Ray or Robert Rawson and apply to the same programming jobs that I would apply to as female. And I would get the jobs if I had a male name and that was the only thing I would change on the CV. So it goes. <laughs> so it goes. Um, so, uh, and this is, uh, this is actually viewable also on an app that the new museum paid for because they've originally co-commissioned co that work with Rhizome. Um, so you can see it there or um, at the Whitney, um, in the Whitney's permanent collection. Uh, so the same year, I started working on this series called Hollow Body Sculptures. Uh, in the way that I made these, this was uh, commissioned first by Art in General, and I showed them at Kim Museum in Riga, Latvia. Uh, the way that these are made is that they, I use a blowtorch to, well, first I make a painting in virtual reality. Um, that is, here, let me see. I think this is a good explanation of this. Because this, the way that this um, work, and it continues to evolve because it's a series. So I made an augmented reality piece that reacted to these sculptures in real time. This was originally shown at Hondai, um, the Hondai Museum in, in Seoul. And then it was a traveling exhibition between Beijing and Moscow and Seoul. And, uh, and so this is some of that, the process there. So I'd make these virtual reality, um, these virtual reality paintings 
actually at in residence with a, a Google programming uh, residence, residency, and you can see the, I'm in a commercial for Tilt Brush, which was this application that came out of this residency. Um, and so that's where I started making these and then printed them out, painted them, and then used a blowtorch to soften them. And the reason that they're called hollow body sculptures is because I would use parts of my, um, of my body just to, just to have sort of, sa again, like save points uh, to, in order for them to stand and sort of have this feeling of a, and they're directly, si or they're ex sized exactly to my proportions. Okay, how are we doing on time, actually? Okay, good. So let me see, I'm gonna go to the Zabludovich collection, which is called Stalking the Trace. Uh, this installation was, ex so, is, it was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, actually, we can have a little bit of volume on this. So this piece dealt with sovereignty and control um, at the heart of this piece. And we can take the volume down now. Um, the heart of this piece uh, is a virtual reality piece that um, translated two-dimensional time. So what we sort of, how we explore time, um, you know, in, in most media, right, is that we scrub through time on a 2D plane. And this was translating 2D time to 3D time. Um, and what was challenging about this work is that it was the first time I had done immersive projection while also trying to show a virtual reality uh, piece. And so this gives you an idea of what you were seeing in the headset. This was like still a, in, on the, in the wings of the installation. Uh, what you were experiencing was that you were moving through cataclysmic explosions that with your consent uh, would sort of move forward. Meaning like if you chose to move forward, then uh, the, the piece would progress. Um, and I used a, a movie special effects software uh, to, like, for disaster simulations in order to uh, create this. Uh, so it was a multi-level, like just a really challenging um, installation at the time because you were, I was using real-time virtual reality uh, that, was, that was like tracking real-time movements of each user's body and then also having to account for the physical installation. Um, and the choice for these uh, these apertures on the side was actually, if you, f is everyone familiar with what a zoetrope is? It's an early animation device that you would use apertures in order to, uh, to it's w how all time-based media is, is made, is that there's apertures, right? So it's like the, you're seeing the persistence of uh, multiple frames in order to, for time to be conveyed. And so these, like originally all of those, uh, those first animation device, the devices, those first um, movie devices were all using these apertures, if that makes sense. So you're seeing through slits as frames. Um, and so that was a, the, the, when you walked physically around the installation, uh, you would see these after images. So you can see it here. On the sides here. Um, and so physically you, you were sort of also being, um, yeah, the piece was moving like with your consent as you were physically moving through the, through the installation. Yeah, this was really difficult. So, so this is, so what you're seeing, so like again, like what was at the heart of the virtual reality piece, which was first staged at Sundance, um, Again, it had to do with ca these cataclysms, you know, these like this, using this disaster software in order to um, talk about consent and control and power. Um, and so there's a lot of 
I mean, it, it's a 15 minute run and it goes from, anim so this is all animation that I made and you can see references to the software on the right hand side. And then th this is a disaster simulation that I ran. Um, so you're seeing a combination of what is taken from uh, actually like weather um, simulation uh, sources and then Zabriskie Point and other things, uh, and, but most of it is, is animations that I, I, I you know, made in this uh, disaster software. So. And then we're going to, so I'm almost done. I, this is, I just wanted to go now forward to my most recent show. This is titled Scry. Um, and Scry was a painting show and the main character, again, we're talking, when I'm talking about like self-referential uh, symbols, so this is back to our first or our second slide uh, with this character that uh, had a, a mechanical suit. Um, and scry is a reference actually to um, sc the scry glasses. And um, actually, hold on, let me read this because it's quite beautiful. So the title's taken from where we get the word for black mirror, uh, which is an ancient tool and it's, it's actually in 1 Corinthians, um, and the quote is, for now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know in full, fully, even as also I was fully known. Um, and that is a, is a, it was a tool to, for, for divining. And also um, uh, landscape painters used it as a way to find a new lens for their reference material before photography was invented. Uh, so you would use a blackened mirror in order to see the, all of the values in a sunset without burning your eyes. So yeah, and this is all going through, I mean, it's on the archeological record, it's over 3000 years old. I mean, it's something that um, has been with humanity for so long. And these are sculptures that I, I created these with uh, micro, microcontrollers um, so just a small computers, uh, which, you know, in part, some of my practice involves making these, um, you know, sp like engineering part hardware. And then again, using these LEDs at the center. And then this is some of the process for creating these scry glasses. And that is where I'm going to leave off uh, with this piece that I created at the when the first week that COVID uh, hit us, and so this was the the piece called Boohoo Stamina. Should I leave? Where should I leave off? Maybe we'll leave off. Where, what world do we want to be in? I'm going to go back to the mauve. <laughs> Let's go back here. This is nice. Testing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a lot of questions now. <laughs> and hopefully you do too. Um, well, the, but the first one, I think, you know, I've been looking at your practice for a few weeks now really intently. But I think what I just realized in this presentation was what I find so fascinating about your work is the presence of your own body, of your, of your own, of you as a maker. Um, as a creative, and then at the same time, you as a programmer. So it's these two very, they're kind of in competition in a way, and you've been able to, to create a whole practice around being a maker and also being a programmer. And maybe you can talk about how you've navigated both of these and how actually people receive this. I mean, it's, it's not easy for everyone to understand what you're doing here. <laughs> it's not. It's not. And a lot of it is very experiential. So I think that it it is like a re, you know relational aesthetic experience where you need to actually be in the setting, and your body being played into. It. And I think that's why it it's so successful because your body is involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're not good. No, we're good. Oh. Um, 
Yes, I think, I mean, I, I think that there's something honest about the way that uh, we interact with technology. I mean, you said the uh, mediated experience, which is a, a lot of what the Ma of was um, a, addressing. And in order to do that, I mean, we are bodies moving through space, which is why that is like what installation work is about. And that's why we, you know, that's why I, as an artist, am attracted to making installation work. Um, I don't find that they're in conflict. I actually feel like that's, uh, it's just extremely true to the way that we experience reality today, yeah. you know, so. It's very contemporary. It's just, yeah, honest, you know. So there's, it's not, it's like, it doesn't feel like a forced perspective at all. It just sort of feels like accurate reporting. Um, and, you know, what, what I found fascinating was the work that you talked about where you, the, you made oh, the man, mask? man mask. Man mm mask. -hmm. Um, navigating this historically, historically male dominated world of tech. I mean, still very much so. Well, um, male dominated everything, you yeah. know? It's like, that's just life though. I mean, you know, you don't invent the world, you just are, you're born into it. So that's, um, there's like, there's almost like nothing even to, to add to that, right? It's just sort of, you know, I don't know. It's just, that's just what needed to be said, um, especially around like, you know, virtual reality and then just making something that felt, um, yeah, it's like when I was working with uh, Lauren Cornell, the curator, that was just like a fun, it was a fun thing to just try to, uh, try to do. It was a challenging thing to try to do try to make. Right. I mean, the, the, I do find the tech world, I mean, I don't know, I was into NFTs for a minute and I found it to be really, really challenging to enter into that yeah. um, as, a, as a woman. Um, just the, I wasn't allowed it, you know. Um, Say love you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You put yourself and you've been very successful. I mean, how has that been super challenging have you had to do you feel like you've had to work harder for this no I just have like a naughty like I have like a it's like a like it's funny because like often I'll do a, an artist talk or something and there will be like some dude that wants to talk to me like wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me about like what how much he knows about programming and I just have to say like one thing and it's like and he's like oh like this just I just gave a talk at Columbia and he was like so you're and, like one and he wanted to do that and I was just like like in C sharp I was like, you know C sharp? And he's like, oh no. But I mean like all all of this is like, <laughs> all of this is like, it's fine, you know? It's like, I just like, it's sort of like a feeling of like, get out of my way, I just wanna make what I wanna, like it doesn't matter, you know? And um, also like with AI programming is, it'll be interesting to see how, I mean we'll need people to engineer things, but it's like programming from how we understand it will start to become very like, it, sort of obsolete in a way. Like the way that I understand programming, which is like what, you know, when I'm talking about like what DNA coding is, like or where um, where technology is actually headed, has so much more to do with um, overseeing. Uh, you, I mean, you have to understand these, these things in order to properly over, like oversee them. But, you know, we're in a sort of paradigm shift. In terms because of AI. Mm, yeah. And, yeah, quantum computing and all of it. Do you feel like you want to be a female voice in that sphere, or you just want to be a person in that I sphere? want to be a person, yeah, yeah, which is what Man Mask is about. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about escapism and how it's necessary. How do you manage to escape your own anxieties when your work is so fundamentally complex in its makeup? <laughs> um, I love that question. I love that question for a lot of reasons, because I think when you're making art, that when you're making art, that's the the role, you know, is that you're kind of you're moving through the contradictions, and that's what makes it so endlessly uh, rewarding. Is that you're like moving through these contradictions, and often it's like, and because I I work in um, what feels more like strategic, like programming, or, or like we, strategic meaning like I have to execute a plan. I have an idea and I have to execute a plan. I know I have to engineer these LED screens in order for them to be transparent, you know, which is what these, the, the, these are LED screens that, screens that I had to engineer because I wanted them to look like holograms in the space. So that's what's giving that illusion. Um, so they're just LEDs that are sort of spaced out on a grill. Um, and so there's, which I should have explained, but I was just too nervous and going too fast. But um, <laughs> which is whatever. But the um, the that's like the, so you have this approach, and then you have like the approach of like what it is to be a body in the present, 
And, um, and that's like where my painting practice comes from. Right. That's why I'm making those sculptures. And so I tried to move between those, again, those two contradictions, um, which just is, and going between those is just like, that's like, that's the most fun. You know, I just love to continue to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're a really unique case study. I don't think a lot of people can figure out how to construct something like this physically and then, and then construct it, you know, programmatically. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, here I, mean, I, I think that's um, <laughs> adds to the work. Um, uh, you speak about, you know, I, you know, saw something this week where in one of your videos you speak about art making as being a space of home and comfort. Mm. Um, this specifically resonated with me as because your work is often about uncomfortable things. Yes. Um, can you talk about this? A bit? I think that? that's like, I mean, like again, like the, the. One of my fa it goes. I mean, I could go back so like. I mean, I can zoom out like a lot. I could zoom for yeah. me personally. That is why I love art and making art and engaging in art above anything else because it gives. Um, there is a, there's like a there's respite in the ability to just sort of have something right. It's like doesn't matter if I don't if I understand it or hate it that there's enough space for me to have. Um, what feels like home, and like I guess like in when I'm when I'm talking about that, which is it's interesting that the last question was about escapism, um, is that like home in that context has to do with like a type of like uh, being present, yeah. you know? It's like which is I just like want to feel stable and sort of present, and often right. that does mean just sitting in like some you know what what life is you know home to, which is a lot of pain. You know, so that's like what, you know, that, that in, in, that's why it's, it's just like, you can use escapism, sure, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of come back to what the sort of honest reporting, reporting is, which is that it does contain a lot of pain and suffering, you know, and so that, like, to sort of make a way for that to feel more palatable or a way for that to feel more comforting, comforting is, um, I don't know, just like a, a beautiful challenge. A beautiful humane challenge there must be you must be tasked in some way though I mean you're you're making work about very big public installations that have to do with climate change mm -hmm. um, that disaster you know, you're putting on a headset and you're walking through you know a bombing experience or an experience <laughs> being blown up or something mm -hmm. um, what why do you feel you know what is the drive to do something like this hmm what is the drive? I mean, other than that, the accurate reporting is the only sort of answer I have for that, you know? It just feels like necessary to make, you know? It just feels necessary to make and um, as like a coping mechanism for like what feels like a, a type of like discomfort, you know? It's like how, how to make, yeah, I don't know how to make things that, I don't know, can help us cope with the unfortunate realities, you know? I feel like, for me, my interpretation is you're sort of mediating. The, you're further mediating the reality that we're all, the existential reality of, like, what's going to happen, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, I could, um, I could do that for you. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> okay. Um, I think that um, one of the questions I have that you know, this kind of happened after last night. We were talking a bit, and I like who, what artists inspire you right now? Like, who are you looking at for Ooh. inspiration, or in general? Yeah, what inspires you? Um, I, I mean, there's a big, big list of like the people that I mean, Susan Sontag. I, I borrow this from her all the time, but she talks about a private pantheon, and it's just, like the people that uh, you think about. Like yeah, that you think that you're inspired by, or that you think about um, your work and relationship to, and it's like a sort of surprising list when I usually tell people. But it's like Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt, who I'm showing right now um, in my uh, space in the financial district in um, New York City. Um, it's Maria Lasnig. Uh, I think a lot about Gretchen Bender. I think um, a lot about. I mean, we could go for for a long, long time, um, but I think that's like a good place to kind of. These yeah, are his. But in, what's so interesting is these are historical artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, because it's like the when you get past the um, the sort of let's say like the veneer of it feeling like highly tech, like highly technical or high like sort of dependent on technology at like the work that what we're talking about 
beneath that veneer or the sort of like the medium for what's, you know, what like using technology of today. It's like, it's about something that is, um, you know, that is, that is about, that's outside of time, you know? It's like outside of our, um, that's outside of like what the technology represents is what I'm hoping to do, you know? Can you tell us about this space? Oh, my, yeah. my space? Yeah, and, um, and what you're trying to do with that. Another yes. one of your yeah, we projects can try. <laughs> and a, a place where you're, there's, you're putting others on a platform. Yes. Or I, other ideas. I, I never expected that I would do this because I was like, oh, I have enough admin and like the running the business part of like making, like being an artist, which like no one prepared me for at all. But, um, but it's just so, it's so true. But the, I have, um, my studio's in the financial district and, I, and so I inherited a Dunkin' Donuts because of the, um, the real estate uh, crash the, the, in the financial district. And so I have a, it's called a, it's called Dunkunstall. So it's a Kunsthall in a, uh, which is a German word for uh, an art museum that belongs to the people. It's like a sort of art hall. It's an art hall. Yeah. And uh, Dunkunstall is a, <laughs> is, is its name. And I have a show up of Nancy Holt, who is one of my favorite artists right now. And what I would like to say with that space is um, that it's just, it, in America, it's hard to find, art is really, is really, really rare and it's very, very important. And there's not, outside of major cities, it's difficult to find spaces that, um, that can help foster that. We really do just have like franchise. It's like it is just like it's kind of an endless sea of mm -hmm. Dunkin' Donuts franchises or you know whatever like these sort of cookie cutter, which is fine. But in in those in that sort of operating in the operating system or the infrastructure of America, it's very difficult to find um, safe spaces for uh, making art. You know, because it's a little it's harder to sell to most people. You know, because it's uncomfortable. Right. And maybe for those of you who don't know who Nancy Holt is, um, Nancy Holt is a very uh, famous land artist. Yeah, land artist, conceptual artist, mm -hmm. um, and I'd say underexplored mm -hmm. and underrecognized. Um, and she was the partner of Robert Smithson, who, you know, because of his maleness, um, far surpassed her in popularity. Yeah. So. Yeah. And they're both, I mean, very, yeah, she, he, you, you've seen this work before. It was very, very light. He made this, um, it's called the Spiral Jetty, and it's in Utah, um, and it's just this, the, it's what it sounds like. It is a spiral that he built out into the middle of this, it's a jetty out into the middle of this lake. It's beautiful. Um, and she, um, she made work called Sun Tunnels. There's about, um, they're sort of like Stonehenge pieces that are aligned to the sun, and the constellations, and they're incredible, and they uh, line up to the winter and summer um, solstices, so they make these mm -hmm. like Stonehenge mm -hmm. um, arrangements, but they're using uh, cement conduits, so something that we're sort of familiar with uh, as like um, infrastructure for big cities, so these giant cement right. uh, conduits. Right, and Robert Smithson used rocks from the earth, so mm -hmm. again, a familiar element mm -hmm. um, to make his work. Um, and I find it so fascinating that you know, an artist like you who's working in, in this tech sphere um, is showing a, an artist like Nancy Holt. Um, well, yeah, I mean, at the, it's like in the, oh, oh, this is some of the sculpture, but the, you know, exploring some similar themes, you know, like entropy, which was a part of lossy, um, and um, a lot of experiments and like uh, phenomenological, like, you know, inquiry, which is a lot of what all, all of the virtual reality pieces that I make are about that. Um, and the body, you know, it's like the, the sun tunnels work is uh, made to her, um, exactly to her proportions, standing up with right. her arms up. I have been. Yeah. 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 So. That's Very cool. Very cool. I can't wait to go. Yeah. Wait, we should have put pictures up, but. I know. Yeah. I didn't think we'll about look it. Look online. Um, questions? Yes. Jody's coming with the mic. We well, hello, Rachel, um, and um, bravo, your work is fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I am a musician, I'll just preface by saying that, and something that's always fascinated me is how, you know, we live, we musicians have to live in a realm of, of creative expression and freedom, you know, outside of the realm of right and wrong, and often we, we musicians don't, particularly live in the absolute knowledge, which it sounds like tech and gaming 
has to live to some extent. So I'm just kind of fascinated by how you've married the two things, absolute knowledge and creative knowledge. Like one is entirely outside of the realm of right and wrong. The other requires it in order mm -hmm. for it to function. So I was just wondering, I, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Let, yeah, let me, from what I understand, I think you're asking about, which it's nice to say it as absolute knowledge, but what you're saying is the improv required for creativity, mm -hmm. right? Like the sort of like living in the present, the improv required for creativity sure. as a as a foil for execution-based or strategy-based, yes. programming-based, you know? Um, right. Which is like, you know, again, like when we go back to like these, the, the contradictions that live in making something, you know? And so like there's this kind of, um, it's, it, it's like we can go back to, it's, I, I was, Arden and I were talking about this last night. Right brain, left brain. Yeah, the, like, and it's often, it's like, um, a neurologist would disagree that it's like, that's, but that's how we understand it's a right brain, left brain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny, because it's like, I'll, like, if for um, a project like the, the Ma of, which had to do with sort of figuring out both, mm -hmm. um, it's like the ideas come as, like, as sort of the freedom, you know, it's like what you're talking about, like, sort of like the, um, the, like spontaneous uh, living in the moment freedom of what it is to be creative and to be present, to be in the, a flow state. And then, so those will come and then I'm like, oh, now I have to like figure out how to put all of this down in a sort of like f formulaic execution based. I'm, I'm, that just makes me so curious. That doesn't stop you. That doesn't make you frustrated, you know, from wanting to create or do you see it as sort of like they go hand in hand? No, yeah. I mean, like sometimes it depends. I'll find that like I just finished a big painting deadline and I was having such a hard time. And I was like, I just want to be programming right now because it's like sometimes it just depends on where. It's interesting that one will often be the relief for the other, you know? So like I'll find that um, there'll be some sort of discomfort with the actual, like with the feelings part of being present and making something. And then um, when I'm like, when I've been like doing something that's too strategically based or too much like in programming, uh, what we could call like more like left brain, um, then I'll be like, oh, I miss like I miss the other side. And so it's just about having uh, the I I really needed that for my own practice to be able to go between both. It makes so much sense that you're a Gemini. <laughs> It really does. It really does. I mean, <laughs> rare breed. No. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, your work is very experiential, and have you been looking at, at some point, where, uh, as the observer experiencing your art, where I would have the ability uh, via hologram, you see it with AI and VR already, where my emotions create, you know, that, that hologram, you'll use that traditional, you know, base of oil painting or what have you, but then when I go into that disaster experience, that I have that ability to change that based on, on my emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's all. I mean, it depends on what the work is, but for um, for all of the virtual reality pieces that I talked about tonight, except for Man Mask, um, which had more to do with the technical requirements of the commission, uh, those are all um, f fully interactive uh, to the, like, and mostly using I mean, and there's a lot of other virtual reality pieces that I didn't have time to go into, but they're all using the vector of the viewer uh, to drive the, um, the experience. One more. Thank you. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I hope I can articulate this, uh, that it makes sense, but in this art is, absolutely new for me. I've never experienced it before. So, um, but I'm, I'm going back to kind of the familiarness of, of my art education and I'm thinking, I'm gazing at a, a Monet, uh, you know, at the water's edge and I'm trying to imagine if you've ever thought <clears throat> of creating a self within that garden, let's say, or uh, the water's edge, and, and all of a sudden Monet's uh, painting is alive, and there's um, 
sound of nature and the sound of the water and uh, you're creating yourself within that garden. Does that make sense? Mm, yes, I think I know what you mean. Um, so two things come to mind. I mean, yes, that's the, um, in Lossy, that piece is talking about, uh, that's a, Monet is a plein air painter, right? So he's painting in open air uh, from those water lilies, from that scene. So in the virtual reality piece for Lossy, uh, the, the virtual reality piece was the landscape that I painted from, right? So those sort of fragments, I was the, the sort of islands of memories I was talking about. So I was painting from these virtual reality scenes that I programmed. Uh, and then gave users the ability to then visit that place uh, with the virtual reality installation. But I feel like, so that's like my first response, but I feel like, and recently, my most recent painting series, I've really, I, I understand painting and, and it is likely my, my, my favorite thing to do because it is harder than these other things actually for a lot of reasons, um, but I think the, the way that we should read all art, but especially painting, is that to imagine, and it's more difficult with work that is new media, that is new media, of course, it's a completely different thing. But for painting especially, to remember that what you're looking at is a time capsule. And I've said this in a lot of interviews, but you have to remember that like the artist stood where you're standing, right? And so you're looking at actually like, you're looking at the traces of decisions and brush strokes, especially for um, abstraction, you're looking at something that represents uh, a record of that time and it is just like it's it can crush your heart it's so beautiful in that in just in the expression of that and so when I'm making paintings um, I showed one very briefly I wanted to more focus on uh, the reason that I make the hologram combines but when I'm making paintings that is often why I like to use large expressionistic marks because I want the viewer to understand that I'm thinking about um, my time while I made it you know, and the energy uh, behind uh, the, that mark making um, while I made it. Yeah, there is a, a influence of ex abstract expressionism in your work, I'd say. Yeah, um, that's, and, yeah. And your source material for these paintings. Um, oh, what, which part? The it, I'm, I feel like we can trace your source material for a lot of these digital p pieces, but what about the painting behind oh, it. Oh, it's just myself. Yeah, that similar to the sculptures, I'm just talking about myself as the as the vector. So like really just trying to f distill the present, go as far into the present as I poss possibly can. And then the sources that are um, representational are usually uh, self-referential okay. or recursive, right? They're using symbols or virtual reality pieces or some sort of, um, some sort of source material that's like my own, you know? So it's like, either for in the case of lossy there are these sort of like memory containers we could right. call them or uh, in the case for scry those mechanical um these sort of like mech suit um figures were a reference to this character that i made when i was i don't know age eight to age 15 or something so like yeah and so and and felt smaller is it you there's a figure in there oh yes yeah yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and we can go look at that now. Yeah, but, we can go look. Um, it felt smaller. Um, I'm like, oh, I wanted to ask one. Okay, um, but you're such a an interesting, a unique individual, and I'd say that I have never shared a stage with someone like you. And I'm very pleased and proud to be here tonight. And thank you, everyone. Um, let's go look at our work in the gallery. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arden. <laughs>